ahead and start um, with the call to order and roll call. Also, sorry, I, I forgot, so I'll remind everyone. We have new microphones, so if you press the push button and the green light comes on, that's how you talk into the microphone. If you wanted to mute yourself, just press. Very similar to the last ones, but a little bit of a facelift. Okay, I'll do the roll call. Committee member Hodges? Here. Committee member Larson? Here. Committee member Lieberman? Here. Committee member Melgen? Here. Chair Fassoon? Here. And Vice Chair Mohammed is uh, not present this evening. Okay, with that we can move on to the land acknowledgement. So the city of Albany recognizes that we occupy the land originally protected by the confederated villages of Lijon. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Ohlone tribe. We thank them for their contributions which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The city of Albany commits to sustaining ongoing relationships with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Can go on to the approval of minutes. Great, and I always, I already mentioned to uh, committee member Melgen, I recognized I spelled his last name wrong uh, in the minutes, so I corrected that already. Were there any other um, edits or questions about the minutes? Okay. Actually, I have one question. Uh huh. I should put this on. Um, I know we talked about um, making revisions to one set of language, and you know, I don't see that reflected in the minutes. But do we, are the minutes action minutes? Like, how detailed should the minutes be? They're just action minutes, so it's really I put a little bit more in them already than just action minutes, okay. like a brief summary, and then any motions that are recorded. Okay. Yeah, the change was made to okay. the. Um, uh, Remind me what that was. It was about the heat pump program, I think. Right, right. Yes, that change was reflected and that went to the city council. Okay, great. Minutes are great. I'm happy to move forward on approving I'll the minutes. I'll make a motion okay. to approve the minutes then. Okay. Do we have a second? Sure. Okay. Seconded. All right, I'll go through the roll call vote. Committee member Hodges? Yes, yes. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Committee member Melgen? Yes. Chair Fassoon? Yes. Great, motion carries. Okay, should we move on to public comment? Yes. I see that we have one member of the public with their hand raised. And as a reminder for the audience, this is for members of the public to make comments on items that are not on the agenda. Jeremiah, you are muted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, it's good to be back again. Um, as the uh, usual, only public comments. I don't know if you're expecting anybody else, but it's me. So I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, SB 1383, I just want to remind everybody about it, um, you know, just raise more awareness, I guess. <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk lately about uh, green waste collections on Solano or maybe even San Pablo, but I guess specifically the business district on Solano Avenue. And uh, I was doing some research reading the SB 1383, um, there's a few things saying that, you know, the, the jurisdiction is actually supposed to uh, supply green waste to its residents. And it was kind of hard for me to understand. Um, for me, I interpret it as <clears throat> the, uh, the jurisdiction, meaning city of Albany, is supposed to provide it. Um, as in pay for it. I mean, okay, for short instance here, I'm a longshoreman at the Port of Oakland and I'm union. 
And if these companies, the shipping companies, or PMA, Pacific Maritime Association, if they require something, then it's they have to provide it. So, for instance, you know, we have to wear steel-toed boots. <laughs> well, PMA's got to pay for it then. So we get a $200 voucher for Red Wings every year, every July 1st. So that's just an example on if it's a law, if it's required, um, then the, the jurisdiction should pay for it. I mean, there was all these mask mandates these past couple of years. And I always felt that, hey, if, if so-and-so is requiring us to wear masks, well, then they got to pay for it. Because now, now buying masks and everything was put on the people. And that's just another expense. So anyway, long story short, um, you know, I'm not sure if the city of Albany is supposed to pay for green waste, but it'd be nice to get that clarified. So I got a little off track there, but not too far off track. But I just want to maintain my public comment um, about green waste on Solano. Uh, that's a big priority and green waste in the parks. So, all right, well, that's it. Just uh if we could provide green waste on Solano sometime, that'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. If any other members of the public would like to make a public comment on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand or step up to the dais. Seeing none, back to you, Chair Fasoon. Okay, with that, looks like we can go on to announcements. Um, so we can start with item 4-1, which is sustainability events and resources. Yes. I just wanted to highlight three um, announcements and resources made available from our partners this month. The Alameda County Clean Water Program is offering a free webinar on ridding your garden of weeds without toxic chemicals and weed killers. You can learn more about this at cleanwaterprogram.org. Um, from East Bay Community Energy, there's a Partners and Pals Clean Cooking Contest. If you post a photo or video of something you've cooked on an induction cooktop, you could win your very own cooktop. If you need to borrow a cooktop in order to do the program, uh, the City of Albany lends out cooktops. Um, and you can learn more about that on our website. From Stop Waste, Stop Waste is offering $1 million in grant opportunities to nonprofits, businesses, and institutions with projects aimed at increasing individual, business, and community involvement in the prevention of waste in Alameda County. There are several grant funding opportunities available for a variety of project scopes and services. You can learn more at stopwaste.org. The deadline to apply is March 3rd. That's all I have for sustainability events and resources. I'll pass it to Natasha for the update on the street tree management plan. Um, I can go ahead and give a brief update on the street tree management plan process. So um, as you may know, that plan has been split up into two phases. The first phase being the tree inventory component. And that's about 60% completed and the anticipated completion of the inventory should be around late spring. So for the second half, um, the second phase, we are currently in the process of drafting a request for proposals for consulting services. And a draft was taken to the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Commission last Thursday. And we will be taking a finalized RFP to council on March 6th, and it'll shortly go live after there to solicit um, yeah, consultants for the project. Thanks, Natasha. And now we have one last update on the heat pump rebate program from Michelle, who's joining us virtually. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen quickly. Um, so an update on the heat pump rebate program. Um, at our last city council meeting, we, uh, we brought your recommendations for updating the program or adding additional funding to the program to the council. And the council did um, approve an additional $65,000 of funding for the program. Um, and they also made a few adjustments as well. So the first one, uh, which was in the uh, recommendation we discussed at our last meeting, was that the signing bonus for contractors be raised to $750, um, which the council approved um, and also made it so that contractors who register with Bay Rent or Tech 
can be eligible for that signing bonus. Um, a few other changes. Uh, we changed the date for eligibility. Um, originally, it was June 1st of last year that they had to receive the permit after, but it's been many months since June 1st, so um, we've adjusted it. So now that um, anyone who receives, if, if you apply within four months of receiving your heat pump permit, you are eligible for the rebate. And then finally, we have new rebate amounts. Um, so these adjustments were made by the city council um, largely in an effort to focus more on equity and um, different create different rebate amounts for different income levels rather than um, potentially having a lot of the money go to people that could afford heat pumps without it. Um, so the new rebate amounts, we have slightly lower standard rebate amounts. So $1,000 for ducted heat pumps, $500 for ductless, and $500 for electrical panel upgrades. And then there's a new category in here for moderate income households. So these are households that make between 80 and 120% of the area median income, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more about in just a second. Um, these households are eligible for a $2,000 rebate for a ducted system, $1,000 for ductless, and $1,000 for the electrical panel upgrade. And then finally, for low-income households, these are households with below 80% of the area median income, and the amounts for these are the same as they were before, with $3,000 for a ducted system, $1,500 for ductless, and $2,000 for electrical panel upgrade. So now there are these three different groups um, and different rebate levels for those groups. And there's more information about the income levels. Um, if anyone's curious, they can go on this website to look. This is albanyca.org slash heat pumps. Um, but it, it will show you the income limits based on household size um, to determine whether your household is low income, moderate income, or above moderate and fits in that standard category. Um, to be clear, all Albany residents are eligible for the heat pump rebate regardless of income. They just get a higher rebate amount if they fit into the moderate or low income categories. So that is the update on the heat pump rebate program. Thank you, Michelle. Do we have any questions from the committee members? Okay, seeing none, I do see that we have a member of the public with their hand raised. If you want to open it to public comment, Chair Fasoon? Yeah, let's go over to public comment. Jeremiah? Good evening. I hope everybody's having a nice evening. Uh, thank you for letting me be included. I really appreciate it. I have a question for Lizzie and, a, uh, and a, also a question for Michelle. So I'll start with Lizzie. You mentioned the stopwaste.org. Uh, I, I logged on real quick and it said there's grants for uh, food recovery programs. Um, I might go for that since I got Elaine's Love food recovery program going on Thursdays. Um, but you know, so I was wondering, have has this committee or the city council adopted any resolutions or made some sort of commitment on restaurants in Albany? Um, providing some sort of service to pick up uh, food waste or food recovery at the end of the day. You know, for example, you know, restaurants have extra meals or, you know, let's say Cafe Raj has extra rice. Instead of dumping the rice in the trash can, or I'm sorry, not the trash can, um, the green waste, um, you know, is there some sort of resolution saying that each restaurant, um, you know, shall, referring to mandatory, must have some sort of re a food recovery program. Um, and also uh, for Michelle, the $65,000, I was at the city council meeting and I was just wondering where the money's coming from. Is that from the sugar sweetened beverage tax or is that from some sort of measure like, you know, DD or M or some sort of letter from the alphabet? Thank you for um, taking the time to hear me out. Just those two questions, please. I can quickly answer the first question before we go on to other public comment, and then I'll pass it to Michelle. 
Um, restaurants in Albany are subject to the requirements outlined in SB 1383 and implemented locally as the Alameda County Organics Reduction and Recycling Ordinance, which the city of Albany opted into, which took effect January 1st, 2022. So um, although restaurants, restaurants aren't currently required to donate all food, there are regulations that are being rolled out and a program um, currently run by the county to ensure that they're in compliance. Michelle, do you want to answer the second question? Yeah, so the funding is coming from the Community Development Department budget, um, which stems from the general fund. This program is sort of, um, it's within a group of programs that are categorized as Measure DD funded, um, even though that's technically from the general fund. It's a way of keeping track of our use of money on climate funds. Um, but general fund is the basic answer. Okay, we'll go to our next public comment. Kathleen Hazen. Yeah, that's uh, actually Nick Peterson. Kathleen is my wife. Um, yeah, th uh, great report on the uh, heat pump um, incentive program. It's really taken off and I, I think that's great. One thing I was wondering if, you, if it could be considered, I, I think it's great we have the moderate and the low income, but again, if nobody applies, all the money goes to the upper income. So I'm wondering if it would be possible to have a set aside or a reserve amount, say, you know, 20% must go to uh, very, you know, the low income and 10% and to the moderate, which is the 70% for everybody else. The, I know the question then becomes, well, what if no one applies? Well, then that sort of puts the burden on the city to do more outreach to low income and moderate income people. I think those are the ones that are most challenged in even finding out about these programs and being able to take advantage of them probably need a little bit more assistance anyway in order to qualify. So I, I strongly encourage you to do that. Thank you. Okay, there are no other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to you, Chair Fassoon. Okay, um, with that, should we move on to presentations? Um, yes. Uh, our first presentation uh, is less of a presentation, but more of an opportunity for all the members of the committee to provide brief personal introductions um, on your name. Uh, maybe how long you've lived in Albany, what your background is, and what brought you to the Climate Action Committee. Um, maybe we can just go down the line by um, alphabetical order. Um, so, uh, Committee Member Hodges. Hello, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here for my first meeting. Uh, my name is Troy. I've been in Albany for about a year and a half. Um, I grew up in, in Walnut Creek nearby and I'm um, excited to, to be on this side of the Caldecott now. Uh, I've worked in the energy space for 10 years now, have been researching a number of different questions around what is the fastest way to decarbonize our grid in a way that's reliable, affordable, and as equitable as possible. Uh, currently in my day job, I work on modeling the electric grid at a granular level, looking at the adoption of solar, batteries, uh, building electrification, electric vehicles, and working with utilities and regulators to make sure that um, the grid will be able to accommodate and promote those technologies. Um, yeah, I'm also the proud user of a new induction stove where I got convinced to go for it with the Albany Cookstop Lending Program, Cooktop Lending Program, uh, and was made the purchase is made possible by a Bay Ren rebate. So, huge believer in local and county action and pushing for for good change. And yeah, excited to be here. Hi, I'm Eric Larson, and um, I've been in Albany for 27 years and um, have a house over on Curtis Street, right across from Marin Elementary School. So there's a huge construction project going on there that's <laughs> Marin Elementary School, so it's been pretty fun to watch that. Um, uh, by day, I'm a marketing product manager for a medical devices company, so nothing to do with sustainability or uh, <laughs> energy, but my passion really is sustainability and, and um, especially the climate issues going on and, and uh, enacting change locally. I volunteered with a, a nonprofit called NorCal Solar for a number of years. 
uh, that was promoting um, solar energy and um, the you know education and the use of solar energy, and um, with the solar industry being so successful, it felt like that was you know well on its way, and and I wanted to get involved a little bit more locally, so I um, joined on the climate action committee uh, five years ago. So I've done a couple of tours on the committee so far, so I'm really enjoying it, and um, uh, yeah, I'm excited about the the good work we're doing here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mira. I'm a student over at Albany High School. Um, I've lived in Albany, I want to say, 14 or 15 years, so a while. Um, I grew up here. I went to Ocean View for kindergarten. Um, and I've been doing environmental work for about three or four years so far. Um, it started a lot with groundwork, grassroots organizing, and advocacy, um, and grew to do a lot of environmental research. Um, started at Stanford and now I'm working at the US Department of Agriculture. Um, so I've loved you know, growing in my environmental journey and I'm excited to go study that um, in future education. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. All right, <clears throat> hey, I'm Dan Lieberman and I've lived in Albany since 99. Uh, and uh, I've been working in renewable energy the whole time. I started working in renewable energy um, policy after finishing grad school in 98. And then I think I might have been the second person in Albany to install solar in 2001, a very early adopter. Um, that's been an interesting journey. And um, let's see, my um, I served on the sustainability committee for the city from 2007 to 14. So when it originated, I was one of the original members. Uh, now just returning to Climate Action as my second meeting. And uh, my day job is I'm marketing director at East Bay Community Energy. And so I am looking forward to connecting some of those dots there between what EBCE is doing and what Albany is doing and sort of create a two-way communication there. My name is Mark Melgen. And if you pronounce <laughs> the name, the D in the middle is silent. My wife and I moved to Albany in 1986. Our daughter and her husband also live in Albany along with our two grandkids. Uh, I used to do a lot of hiking, backpacking, car camping, that sort of thing. Lately, I find that I have more fun playing with the grandkids. Uh, and they're part of the reason that I'm here. Uh, in terms of background, uh, I have a degree in chemistry from Caltech. I worked for over 30 years at PG&E, uh, starting on a bunch of air quality issues related to the power plants, and then uh, volunteered to work on each uh, climate initiative that came along, starting with, nobody here has heard of it probably, but the Big Green initiative that was on the California ballot in 1990, and then the uh, Federal Acid Rain Program in 1995, the NOx emission retrofits on the power plants, that pg e used to own in the 90s, and a whole, whole bunch of those things. And in between, various different kinds of analysis and forecasting for the uh, electric supply planning and operations departments. When Governor Schwarzenegger signed the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, I volunteered and got into pg es climate policy group. And there I was the uh, a technical person to work with the ARB staff on the real nuts and bolts of cap and trade to make sure that it was a fair and efficient system. And clearly we've succeeded because you never see any headlines about it. <laughs> uh, and I've been retired for a few years, but I keep up to date to some extent by following the UC Energy blog and the grid, the California ISOs news and so on. Thank you. And I'm glad to be here. Great. This is kind of a non-traditional um, presentation, so I don't know if any of you all have questions. But if not, we do have a member of the public with their hand raised. Yeah. Okay, if there are no questions, we can go to public comment. Okay, Jeremiah. Yeah, thank you. You know, it was really nice uh, as a public attendee um, to hear a little bit about each uh, committee member it's really nice as a, a member of the public to, you know, have some awareness about who uh, is representing us in Albany. 
because you know you are representing the citizens to advise city council on climate action. Uh, so I commend all of you for everything you do. I mean, it's so great. Um, you know, Chair, you got a job at the USDA. Congratulations. I mean, it's right in Albany. That just works out great. And I'm USDA. That's that's amazing. Um, you know, and the new gentleman on the left, um, I forgot your name. I'll, I'll try to start remembering it. But I mean, I, all the you, the work you do with your career and everything and all your studies, that's, that's wonderful. I know you're going to bring a lot of great input and great advice to uh, Albany. Um, and also, uh, uh, Mr. Lieberman, you know, I, I think you were definitely <laughs> one of the first two in Albany to install solar panels. And I want to congratulate and commend you on that. That's, that's so great to see a, a, a member of the public take action in the moment, you know, 20 years ago um, to be a leader of climate action in Albany. Um, you definitely deserve some sort of, you know, recognition for that, some sort of, you know, certificate or, or something. Um, I mean, I know my science teacher, Mr. Downing at Albany High, I know he had solar panels in, in 2001. So, yeah, I believe you were definitely the, in the top two for sure. Um, so that's about it. Thank you and uh, good luck, everybody, and keep up the good work. And I'm so happy to have all these educated people uh, representing us in Albany. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other members of the public with their hand raised. So back to you, Chair Fassoon. Okay, and with that, we can go on to item 5-2, which is equity and climate action and adaptation planning. All right, that'll be me. Let me go ahead and widescreen this so that everyone can see. Also, thank you for dimming the lights. <laughs> All right, and that should full screen. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Natasha Gallatin. I'm a Civic Spark Fellow for those I haven't been able to meet formally. And just a little bit of uh, background on Civic Spark. It's an AmeriCorps program that's dedicated to building capacity in local public agencies. And I've studied um, a little bit of urban planning in my undergrad, and I've had an interest in getting some experience in, at the local level. So here I am. And so tonight, I'll give an overview on equitable, community-driven, climate preparedness, planning, and action. Kind of a mouthful, but in this presentation, I'll go over what that actually entails. Um, some important vocabulary to highlight uh, in addition to some background information. I'll also go ahead and highlight some of the best practices that were included in the guide that were a part of the that we're a part of the memo, and I'll end off with some local programming that I think exemplifies some of these best practices and ways that we can continue to foster an inclusive and vibrant community. So like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and provide a little background. Um, as we all know, planning for uncertainty is a challenge as it is, and the Bay Area and Albany has been no strangers to the extreme weather events that we've been experiencing um, in California from the atmospheric storms at the beginning of this year, and we also experienced an extended uh, heat wave just a couple months prior in September. So. Yeah, with increasing frequency and severity of these weather events, it's really important to keep in mind that while climate change um, affects everybody, they don't impact everyone equally. And so uh, people of color, especially black, indigenous, and Latinx communities and lower income populations um, experience exposure and sensitivity to climate hazards and typically have reduced capacity to adapt. So that's why it's critical to center equity and planning and action and continually make equity considerations to elevate the concerns and priorities of groups that face the brunt of these climate hazards. So I've thrown um, the term equity and also equality, but I also wanna make a distinction that there's a fundamental difference between the two. So equality is about sameness, meaning that everyone um, receives the same thing, regardless of all other factors. Whereas equity, on the other hand, is about fairness and acknowledging that people may have different starting points and require different levels and types of support. So with that being said, equality is only helpful when everyone starts off at the same place, and that is clearly not the case. So equity is necessary before equality. 
And this ties directly to climate equity, which ensures that the fair distribution of the benefits of climate actions um, are distributed uh, among the frontline community members that experience the brunt of, like I said, these climate hazards. And frontline community members um, face intersecting vulnerabilities, as said in the slide, and this includes racial discrimination, housing insecurity, and also um, Isolation uh, due to language barriers, among other things that magnify climate threats. And then I'll go to the next slide. So as you may all know, lower income communities and communities of color are more likely to reside in areas of greater climate risks, such as storm surges, urban heat islands, poor air quality, and other environmental pollutions due to historically racist and exclusionary housing policies. So achieving uh, climate equity requires that implementation of climate action and policies simultaneously address these past harms and systems that perpetuate these inequities in society and which is ultimately what the equity planning framework strives to do. So like I said, I'd explain exactly what equitable climate driven uh, climate preparedness planning looks like. So at the core of this framework is authentic and purposeful climate um, community engagement. And this is essential in building resilience because it ensures that the issues of greatest concern for communities disproportionately impacted are elevated throughout the entire process. And community resilience is the capacity of a, co of a community to bounce back from an adverse event. And I wanna note that it's more than just a collection of resilient individuals, but rather, um, a community with deep social cohesion and one where everyone has access to resources necessary for them to thrive and live, meet their potentials. On the right side, which is a little hard to see, um, I want to highlight that the short-term climate actions that prepare communities to reduce hazards will be more affected when they're coupled with these long-term actions aimed at addressing institutional and structural inequities because they are sources of these increased climate risks. So some of these long-term actions can be poverty elimination, increased political representation, and also um, yeah, anti-discrimination. Let me go ahead and go to the next slide. So this slide is, um, this is the spectrum of community engagement. And I think this is a really helpful tool in thinking about where a community is at, who has been involved already, who hasn't been in uh, the decision-making process, and also for developing specific strategies for engaging people who have been historically excluded. So on the far left end, and this isn't actually captured in this spectrum diagram, but on the far end, we have what we call marginalization, which represents the status quo, meaning that the outcomes of climate action um, can and will continue to perpetuate these inequities. So the most common form of community engagement among mainstream institutions is consultation. And that's kind of where we bring um, pre-existing plans and have community members give their feedback kind of in this one-way information exchange. And as we move towards the right, um, the difficulty of engagement and also public impact increases, especially with more capacity investments across multiple sectors. Um, but it's also important to know that not all strategies and solutions uh, will work because that's where local context is critical. And yeah, I will go ahead and explain what local context is. Local context is driven by community priorities, relationships, capacity, and also political dynamics. This ultimately decides how equity will be incorporated to accomplish climate action goals. Uh, but many public agencies uh, face time and budget constraints, in addition to public mistrust in government a lot of times and a lot of other factors that make conducting effective and authentic public engagement really challenging, but not impossible, um, especially in a community like Albany with a very, uh, very active climate leaders and community groups. 
All right, and lastly, um, I just want to highlight some of the local programming that we have in Albany. Some of them were already mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, but the Street Tree Management Plan is an example of climate action that considers equity into its process. So when we have the completed street tree inventory, this will give us a good idea of which neighborhoods in the city are lacking tree canopy. And this usually tends to fall along, along the red lining map that I had illustrated earlier. So prioritizing planting in these underserved regions and also examining any other barriers that pose any other barriers that are there, for instance, hardscape conditions and other things that, yeah, um, a lot of things will be revealed through like the data analysis thing. And it's really important to work alongside these frontline community members when doing data analysis because that's where you get the most authentic lived experiences and ultimately shape the most effective and relevant solutions for the community. So that's the street tree management plan. Um, I also wanna highlight the heat pump rebate program that Michelle had uh, mentioned in the beginning of this meeting. So that's a great program, um, especially with the increasing number of extreme heat events. There are barriers to adapt to these increasing temperatures. Some housing stocks are not suited to withstand really high heats, and these substandard housing um, properties are often resided by lower income communities, <laughs> and these communities might also not feel safe opening their windows at night, and they also may not have air conditioning to be able to, yeah, prevent <laughs> extreme heat and other health-related illnesses. But ultimately, it's really important to distribute um, resources to the community members that need the greatest help and yeah, essentially meeting these members where they're at. And I also lastly wanna highlight the picture on the bottom left. It's a picture of this prototype heat shelter. This is driven from community research in Oasis, California, which is a city in SoCal, but they identified that transit users are especially vulnerable to these urban heat island effects. And without shelter, well, they don't have a personal vehicle to be able to get to point A to point B. They don't have air conditioning. Um, in a car they don't have, so this was something driven by community research and has been implemented in SoCal. And I just thought it was a great example. But yeah, thank you so much for listening and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think it's really, really important to, to emphasize the ways that of what an equitable process looks like. Uh, yeah, I was just curious, can you talk about some of the ways with I don't know, when you know, different environmental programs are getting off the ground in Albany, how we, how we make sure that these kind of these principles get embedded or at least kind of like checked for? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm gonna refer back to a previous slide that I probably just skimmed over, but I think this collaborative data analysis strategy is really important because like I said earlier, elevating the voices of the people that are most impacted is critical. And unfortunately, a lot of times um, there are capacity and bandwidth issues. So I think it is important for community members that are aware of these kinds of issues, kind of mobilize other community members. Word of mouth is really powerful. Um, but especially with a certain mistrust in government, I think having members of the community that they can lean on and trust and when they have uh, a connection to the government and also kind of support that programming, when there's like a collaboration, I think that's when there's like stuff that happens. There's like magic that happens. Um, yeah, excuse my uh, yeah, lack of descriptive words, but I think the collaboration is key and overcoming that capacity uh, issue is critical. 
Um, I imagine other parts of city of the city services are facing similar um, challenges and have similar goals around equity. I mean, is that being socialized in the city across, you know, building, transportation, other other services that the city offers? Meaning, are we collaborating with other departments to address? Yes. Yeah. Any way we can. Um, and I think particularly the reason we wanted to have Natasha provide this presentation this month is because as we look through priorities for CAC work plan implementation in the upcoming year, we want to make sure we're employing these solutions, not just within the work we're doing, but also encouraging in any work that our work touches upon other departments um, or any parts of the community, we want to make sure we're considering these best practices in equity and environmental justice. Thank you. Any other questions for Natasha? Okay, we do have two members of the public with their hand raised. If you'd like to go to public comment. Yep, let's go over to public comment. Okay. Jeremiah. Oh, okay, I'll go first, no problem. <laughs> um, I was being patient in case I was going second. Hey, so uh, Natasha, thank you for the presentation. Um, the spark some ideas, uh, no pun intended with the whole spark thing. <laughs> we got the civic spark program. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I really took interest in the, the shade canopy. Yeah, you, pop, you <laughs> popped it up exactly as I said that. That was perfect timing. You know, that really sparked my imagination. Um, what a great solution. I know, for instance, Solano Stroll, it gets really hot. Uh, <clears throat> and so I just imagine right now in Solana, we have benches. And that kind of zone is just a bench. But what if that bench had more things? For example, a, a shade canopy. And the shade canopy was made out of some solar panels, you know, angled toward the south or something. And and then from that solar panel, there was a, an outlet for people to charge their phone. So they could sit on the bench in the shade, charging their cell phone or their laptop at the same time going on, you know, free Wi-Fi on Solano or something. Um, and then also incorporating a, a drinking fountain or a water filling station. So I think these, the benches we have on Solano is right now a starting point. It's very basic. But if we expand it to a solar powered shade canopy with an outlet and a drinking fountain or a water filling station, every bench will be a big time resource. So I've just got this big vision for these benches to kind of be upgraded. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for sparking my imagination. Um, it'd be nice to see those on the work plan. Uh, those are great. I, um, I can't see my time. Do I have 10 seconds left? You have 45 seconds left. Oh, okay. So yeah, I mean, as a longshoreman at the Port of Oakland, uh, during the summertime, it gets very hot, extremely hot. And the companies and, and our unions are really big on drinking water, uh, staying out of the sun for, for reasons of heat exhaustion and heat stroke. And so people can get really sick. And so I think these, uh, these canopies will be very good for all Albany residents, senior citizens, and just anybody. Uh, so yeah, hopefully those canopies, those shade areas, can be upgraded with water and electricity and solar panels. Thank you for the presentation, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Okay, next public comment is Elaine Stelton. Elaine? Hi, um, this is Elaine Stelton, and I apologize if I tuned in a bit late and missed this, um, but I'm trying to understand exactly what a heat pump is, and if you explain that, again, forgive me. Um, but I'm just, I just Googled it. It says a device that transfers thermal energy in the opposite direction of spontaneous heat transfer, which doesn't mean anything to me either. And then... Uh, below that, it says a heat pump is a device that can heat a building 
um, and I don't know how much of a building it can heat, uh, by transferring thermal energy from the outside using a refrigeration cycle. So again, if you've explained this, you do not have to answer uh, this evening, but if you haven't explained <laughs> it to the public, it would be very helpful if you did. Thanks so much. Okay, I'll just quickly share for that uh, member of the public who made that comment and anyone else who's interested, you can learn more at www.albanyca.org slash heat pumps. That's H-E-A-T-P-U-M-P-S, plural. Uh, albanyca.org slash heat pumps. Uh, we'll not go back to discussing what that is since it was a previous agenda item, but for anyone who's interested. There are no other members of the public with their hand raised, so back to you, Chair Fassoon, if there's any discussion. There's no action item on this, but if anyone wants to make a comment or uh, just congratulate Natasha for a great presentation, <laughs> I'll share that I know the city is thankful for the Civic Spark program because Fellows like Natasha get regular trainings on equity and environmental justice best practices and they bring it um, to city staff um, and to the work that they're doing, which I admire. So I appreciate that she was able to put together this presentation. Thank you, Natasha. And can I say the agenda item or the agenda materials were so long and dense and you did a fantastic job of boiling it down. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was unfair of me to attach all of those dense readings and for me to not even give a digest. So I appreciate you listening to it. Yeah, thank you for that presentation and for bringing in the, the importance of equity. Um, and also clearing up the importance between equity and equality. I think a lot of people, when they think about climate equity, they have the same vision of, oh, we're all equal. Um, but kind of, I really appreciate, especially the graphic that you included on one of your slides about really showing that, and it's important that us as a city, we're incorporating that. Um, so yeah, wonderful presentation, thank you. Does anyone else have anything? If not, we can move on. Okay. Okay, great. We'll move to agenda item 5-3. This is an advisory body reminder presentation and a work plan review. Um, I will make this quick as there is a advisory body training coming up on March 2nd in person um, from 6 to 7.30 at the Albany Community Center. I'll share a slide on that. You should have just received an email. I was hoping I would break the news to the public because I learned about it just before this meeting, but I guess the city clerk beat me to it in an email before the meeting started. Um, but let me share my screen. Okay, so for the Climate Action Committee, each committee or commission in the city has a council-designated purpose. The Climate Action Committee's purpose is to serve as a technical advisory committee regarding matters related to climate action and to advise council on matters related to, one, reducing greenhouse gases, and two, adapting to climate change. And I think all of us here today and any members of the public can acknowledge that climate change, sustainability, environmental justice touches on almost anything we do um, at this point. Uh, however, we do still have to recognize if there's another committee that has a purview that's more directly related to um, something such as something that often comes up are transportation related items like we discussed last month. Um, sometimes those matters, if they're better handled by another committee and their council designated purpose, we'll defer to them. Um, but our council designated committee purpose is to reduce greenhouse to gases, adapt to climate change, and I think a great way to look at that is to think about the climate action and adaptation plan that was adopted and how we can best implement that and engage the community in implementation of that plan. The advisory body role is to advise council on matters within the committee's scope. Uh, and the scope of responsibility is defined in the 2021-2023 work plan approved by council. And I attach that to the agenda packet um, as an opportunity for the committee to review that. 
Um, there's no action to be taken on the work plan this evening, uh, but I think it is important for the committee to continue to reflect back on what the items on the work plan are, how we can make sure we're moving towards implementing actions that were already defined on the work plan. Um, we're not at this time adding new actions, though whenever the work plan term is up, which I believe is at the end of this fiscal year, um, there will be an opportunity to do a new work plan um, creation exercise. There are attendance policy and quorum requirements for this committee. Um, it's like if you're back in high school, I'm sure Mira's used to this. Uh, if you have excessive absenteeism, it may be grounds for removal from the committee. Also, please, if you do have to be absent, please notify your staff liaison, which is me, at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting. That helps us plan for quorum. Um, it would be a real big bummer if we got here and there were only three members and everyone had to go home and we'd set up all the AV equipment. Um, so it's great to have at least a 24 hour notice. I love to request at least a week notice if possible. Um, and usually everyone is very good about that, so thank you. Members are expected at this point, now that we're hybrid, to attend in person. There are very specific uh, requirements that must be met if there's going to be virtual attendance and that they'll go more into this at the advisory body training. But attending virtually sometimes mean that you'll have to make it a public meeting so members of the public could join you wherever you are taking that virtual meeting. Um, so it's best to just be here in person to avoid people showing up in your living room. Um, our Climate Action Committee quorum, which we're striving towards at every meeting, is four members, though our committee is composed of seven members. We do still have one vacancy. The Brown Act is something that you will learn about in depth during that March 2nd training, but in sum, I think this is a quote that sums it up well, uh, the Brown Act ensures that the public commissions, boards, and councils, and other public agencies in the state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. It is the intent of the law that their actions be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. So often, um, if we have uh, ongoing matters that the committee is deliberating on, it's very important that any decisions that are being made or discussions that are being made between individual members of the committee happen in the public meeting format so that members of the public have an opportunity to hear what committee members are saying, weigh in on the decision making, and make public comment. So some of the most important highlights from the Brown Act are meetings must be properly noticed and open to the public. Members shall not discuss or make decisions on CAC-related matters outside of a public meeting. Members cannot discuss, deliberate, or decide on matters not listed on the agenda. That's so if someone wanted to discuss something that was not listed on the agenda, a member of the public wouldn't miss out on an opportunity to weigh in on that decision because they didn't see it on the agenda. And a quorum, which is four more, members may not communicate with each other directly or indirectly through whatever medium. This includes email, text, social media, and also a question that's been coming up for me is Google Docs. We also can't have Google Docs unless it's less than the quorum of the committee. Meetings, all meetings must be conducted in compliance with the Brown Act. Uh, this is, I'm really, um, <laughs> running home, they do not discuss, deliberate, decide on matters before hearing all public comment um, also on items on the agenda. The proper discussion format is to receive the presentation or report, then there's an opportunity for CAC members to ask questions, then the committee receives public comment, and then that public comment feeds into the discussion and the decision making. We wanna make sure we're never jumping straight to decision um, and discussion because we want to make sure public comment is heard first. The established start time for this committee is 7 o'clock p.m. and the established end time is 9 o'clock p.m. So anytime we want to extend the meeting even 60 seconds longer than 9 o'clock p.m. we'll need to have a motion to extend the meeting. The agendas are made publicly available typically on the Friday before the Wednesday meeting. That's 72 hours in advance working hours of our public meeting. The agendas are set by the chair, vice chair, and the staff liaison. We typically meet the week before the agenda is posted publicly to discuss um, items that were requested during the previous meeting 
ongoing items we should continue to discuss and new things that are time sensitive. And together the chair, vice chair, and the staff liaison decide what's an appropriate workload for a meeting to make sure we're striving to not go longer than nine o'clock p.m. and also prioritize those time sensitive items to make sure that action can be taken promptly. Agenda items that are requested must be relevant to the committee purview. We'll sometimes have guest speakers and such, but those are typically also relevant to the committee purview. Um, the announcements section of the agenda is just for quiz, quick announcements, but we'll have to refrain from discussion because they're not agendized discussion items. And future agenda items should be requested by committee members during the future agenda items section of the public meeting. So let's say you have a suggestion for an item for the following meeting. It's important to make that request publicly, verbally, in the public meeting so that a member of the public could weigh in and so that other members of the committee could weigh in as well. Um, we'd like to discourage members from emailing the chair or the staff liaison with requests in between meetings because it doesn't give time for the full committee to decide whether or not they'd like to take that on. Um, and it also doesn't give us a full month to prep for that agenda item. Just some highlights from the advisory body handbook, golden rules of an effective advisory body member. A uh, reminder that you are representatives of the city and representatives of the community. You should consider all sides and all voices, not just your own opinion, even though that's of course important, but make sure you're acting as a representative of the community. Do your homework, so read all those agenda items and be thorough in making your recommendations. Be conscious of the relationship with city council, city staff, and also other committee members. And oh, sorry, establish a good working relationship with other members. And as I mentioned with the teaser, uh, please save the date for the advisory body and Brown Act training. It will be led by our city attorney. It's Thursday, March 2nd from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in person at the Albany Community Center on Marin Avenue. You should have just received an email about that meeting. I'll stop there. Any questions? If you ask me any attorney-like questions, I'll direct you to save it for the March 2nd meeting, but I can answer some basic questions if you have any. Not seeing any. We could take public comment. Jeremiah? Yeah, uh, regarding the, the training, you know, one thing I had always requested more training on since the last two years, I was the school district's appointee for the Social Economic Justice Commission. There was no specific training on subcommittees. And for that lack of training on subcommittees, it was really difficult to learn the subcommittee process um, on you know, how a subcommittee actually operates, right? Um, regarding creating memos, because basically it comes down to creating a memo, submitting the memo and taking action. So it was just really difficult to just learn on the fly, kind of learn by, you know, somebody teaching you or there's just no training on subcommittees. So I really hope that uh, this this term, there's more emphasis on subcommittees because that's really important. Um, you know, when you create subcommittees, what the responsibilities are, you know, how, how to meet, you know, for instance. Uh, I found that the city clerk always sent us a Zoom link, you know, or it was on someone's personal Zoom link, but it was also vague. And so I know there's um, new members on this committee and there, there's a lot to learn about subcommittees. Um, you know, quorum or not quorum, but can't be more than so many people meeting at a time or talking about something. So that's all I just wanted to raise awareness with is, uh, you know, this the training, if there could be more emphasis on subcommittees and everything that involves subcommittees, such as, you know, turning in that memo, creating the memo. All right, well, thank you for letting me speak. Okay, there are no other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to you, Chair Fassoon. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, looks like with that, we can move on to item 6-1, which is the election of chair and vice chair. Yes, so currently our chair is Miroslava and our vice chair is Hadia Mohammed, who's not here this evening. Um, I'll give some information about vice chair and chair elections real quick since we're all new and because it only happens once a year. Uh, the role of the chair is to oversee public debate, ensure public comment is heard, facilitate meeting and decision making, help staff and the vice chair set the agenda. And of course, the vice chair takes the place of the chair in the event of chair's absence during a meeting. To provide the opportunity for all members of advisory bodies to hold a leadership role, the advisory body handbook states that the position of chair and vice chair should be rotated on an annual basis. Though not recommended, if the advisory body does agree that there's a strong preference to continue with the existing chair and or vice chair, they may serve for a maximum of two consecutive years. I believe currently our chair and vice chair have been in this position for a year. Um, so how we conduct the chair and vice chair election, uh, we start with chair election, then do vice chair. Nominations can be made by any committee member for any committee member. The nominations do not require a second, so it's not like a formal motion. Um, and nominations are voted on one by one with the last person nominated voted on first and the majority vote secures the position as chair or vice chair. Any questions about that? Okay, so we'll start with the election for chair. As I mentioned, our current chair is Miroslava and our vice chair is Hadia. Can I ask a question? Uh -huh. So Vice Chair Mohammed is not here. Yes. Um, and do you know her ability to serve as chair? I do not. Okay. Um, I, I can't remember if she's a senior or not. She's a junior, I she's believe. Junior. Okay. Or a sophomore. Okay. Junior. Okay. Well, then I would like to nominate Vice Chair Mohammed as chair. Okay. I think what we can do is we could vote, and then if she were to refuse... Um, the nomination as chair, we could do another election next month. Maybe we'll do that. Um, great. All right, are there any other nominations for chair? Okay, we can take a roll call vote. Committee member Hodges? Um, yes. Uh, committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Committee member Melgen? Yes. Chair Fassoon? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe, unless we hear otherwise in between meetings, um, Hadia Mohammed is our new chair of the committee. <laughs> we'll congratulate her once she learns of her, <laughs> of this honor. That's what happens when you skip a meeting. Right. <laughs> you get nominated to be chair. Um, okay, great. Now we'll move on to a vice chair election. Well, I'll, I don't want to hog the microphone, but I'll move it along. To, I would like to nominate um, vice um, committee member Hodge, um, Melton, vice chair. Committee Member Melgen, do you accept this nomination? Yes. Okay. Do we have any other nominations for vice chair? Very quiet group. Okay, seeing no others, I will go for a roll call vote. Committee Member Hodges? Yes. Committee Member Larson? Yes. Committee Member Lieberman? Yes. Committee Member Melgen? Yes. Chair Fassoon? Yes. Okay, your new chair tentatively is uh, Chair Mohammed, and your new vice chair is chair, Vice Chair Melgen. Congratulations. Um, we can open it up to public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Not seeing any. Back to you, Chair Fassoon. Or sorry, back to you, well, Mark Melgen, you would be the chair for the rest of the meeting as you are now vice chair, become chair. 
Big promotion. <laughs> Help. Well, um, you're welcome to designate uh, Chair Fassoon to run the rest of the meeting if you'd like, or that way we can do a discussion of chair, or you're welcome to give it a try. Up to you. Could I designate you? Would that oh, be yeah. all right? Okay, yeah, because you you know the ropes here. Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll discuss being chair um, before the next meeting. Okay. Well, vice chair and then chair. We'll do a, we'll do a run through. Great. Okay, should we go on to public comment? We did public comment. There were no members. Oh, yeah, there were no members. Okay. So now we can move on to 6-2. Okay. Um, with 6-2, we can go on to proclamations of appreciation for Daniel Chen and Nick Peterson. Okay, I will start with um, the proclamation for Daniel Chen. Um, Daniel, if you are in the audience and would like to be promoted, please raise your hand. If you're going under a, a different name. I don't believe Daniel Chen is online this evening, so I will send this to him after. Share my screen. Okay. A proclamation of appreciation to Daniel Chen for his service on the Climate Action Committee. Whereas Daniel Chen began his service on the committee in January 2021, and whereas Daniel served as chair of the committee from June 2021 to January 2022, and whereas Daniel provided thoughtful insight into how policies proposed by the committee may affect the Albany community and was a champion of social equity and community resilience, and whereas Daniel's passion for climate resilience, particularly related to extreme heat and hazardous air quality, led to fruitful committee discussions and information included in the 2023 Local Hazard Mitigation Plan update, and whereas, as a member of the Zero Emission Transportation Subcommittee, Daniel helped develop the Multifamily Electric Vehicle Charging Pilot Program, and whereas, during his term of service, Daniel was influential in implementing key actions from the 2019 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and whereas, Daniel is recognized by the committee for his commitment to making Albany a more environmentally responsible city. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Climate Action Committee does express its appreciation to Daniel Chen for his service to the city of Albany and wishes him the best in his future endeavors. At this time, I'll stop, see if anyone has any uh, comments before someone makes a motion to adopt a proclamation for Daniel Chen. Um, I, I'll just say I really enjoyed working with Daniel on the committee and I always appreciated his thoughtful uh, responses, very intelligent in, um, in, in the subject matter and, and thoughtful. Great, at this time we'll take a motion to approve the a proclamation. I'll make a motion to approve that proclamation. Okay. Second. Okay. All right, committee member Hodges? Yes, yes. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Committee member Melgen? Yes. Chair Fassoon? Yes. Great, motion carries. Sorry, I'm just, we have new titles. Okay, now I'll move to a proclamation of appreciation for Nick Peterson, and I believe Nick Peterson is in the audience. I'm going to promote him to a panelist to receive this proclamation. Hi, Nick. Oh, you're on mute. Ah, uh, you're muted. I'm changing my name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> While you're doing that, we'll read your proclamation. Okay. 
a proclamation of appreciation to Nick Peterson for his service on the Climate Action Committee. Whereas Nick Peterson began his service on the committee in January of 2017, and whereas Nick served as chair of the committee for one, sorry, from February 2018 to February 2019, and whereas with expertise in sustainable building design and architecture, Nick provided the committee with technical insights and analysis of topics discussed by the committee, including a proposed home energy scoring method for consideration by the committee, and whereas Nick carefully analyzed sustainability policy and effectiveness of programs and challenged city policymakers and staff to advance towards achievement of the city's targets. And whereas Nick is a dedicated member of Albany community groups, including Albany Climate Action Coalition and the Albany Community Emergency Response Team and continues to engage the two groups to engage with city policymaking. And whereas as a member of multiple subcommittees during his tenure on the committee, Nick provided insight into effective and meaningful actions Albany can take to reach carbon neutrality and resilience. And whereas, Nick served on the Green Building Subcommittee and helped develop a number of requirements to make Albany's buildings healthier and more efficient and strongly advocated for city's all-electric new construction mandate. And whereas, Nick supported development and launch of East Bay Community Energy, including recommendation to opt up all electricity counts to carbon-free and renewable electricity. And whereas, Nick was instrumental in the coordination of Albany Unified School District sustainability efforts and provided important input on AUSD's environmental action plan. And whereas, during his term of service, Nick was instrumental in the development and adoption of the 2019 Climate Action Adaptation Plan as well as implementation of key actions. And whereas Nick is recognized by the committee for his commitment to making Albany a more environmentally responsible city. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Climate Action Committee does express its appreciation to Nick Peterson for his service to the city of Albany and wishes him the best in his future endeavors. At this time, I'll take a moment to Nick Peterson if you would like to say anything. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, um, it's nice to see that list. And, uh, you know, I appreciate um, staff being tolerant of me at times when I was being very pushy about things that, that I was um, passionate about. Uh, I know it's not always easy, um, but one, one of the things I wanted to say to the new um, Climate Action Committee members, you know, Lizzie gave a good uh, statement of what your purpose is on advising about reducing greenhouse gas and adopting climate change, but never forget that we're in a climate crisis and this is a huge disaster and emergency and it is an existential crisis, not just for us personally, but for our offspring and their children. So the next seven years are critical. Work as hard as you can to get things through the council. It's not always easy, but I'm sure you guys can do it. So keep up the good work. Okay, this time um, we'll, if anyone would like to say anything um, about the proclamation or propose a motion, the floor is open. Well, I, I'd just like to say that I really, really enjoyed working with Nick over the years. Um, you were on the committee when I started and helped me get my, my feeding, my footing, <laughs> uh, get grounded on, on what, what this committee was all about. Um, I really appreciate your passion for this area. Um, it really helped encourage me to have a voice on this committee. And um, uh, I enjoyed working with you on subcommittees. We um, made some interesting uh, advancements. We got things like the, um, the charging station pilot program helped push that through. So I was, it was a great example of something that we could actually take uh, and make a practical um, impact on the city. And, and I think that, that was one of the, the things that, you know, we, bridging that from theory into practicality is, is difficult. So um, city politics being what they are. So um, I always appreciate your voice of urgency and expressing what's possible um, to be done. So thank you very much for your service. Do we have a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion to 
uh, accept the um, proclamation. I'll second that. Okay. Committee member Fassoon? Yes. Committee member Hodges? Yes. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Vice Chair Melgen? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Thank, Thank you me. all. That's really kind. Thank you. Okay. All right, Nick, we're going to put you back in the audience. You might get lost in Zoom space for a sec, but thank you again for your service. Okay. Great. Okay. Now we can move on to agenda item 6-3. This is the draft 2023 local hazard mitigation plan update. And I have more slides for you all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so those who uh, were on the last cycle of the committee, so I believe Committee Member Fassoon and Committee Member Larson, you've heard about the Local Hazard Mitigation Plan before, but for those who haven't, um, some of this may be new information. So the Local Hazard Mitigation Plan is a document that the city is mandated to have if we want to receive certain federal funding. Um, so hazard mitigation uh, is an important action the city can take to reduce risk to life, property, and the environment from natural hazards uh, and also we can choose to include human-induced hazards in our local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, it's abbreviated LHMP. I will do that to save my voice. Uh, the LHMP provides analysis of all hazards that pose risk to the Albany community and identifies actions to mitigate that risk. The 2023 LHMP update is an adapted version of the original LHMP adopted in 2018 that builds on the successes of the previous version and also adds new hazard information, as well as a lot of information that hazards that occurred during the time the plan was being implemented from 2018 to 2023. Big shocker, I think, seeing us all wearing masks. You can imagine we were uh, a big hazard hit us in 2020 that was not included in the plan that now is. The LHMP is a planning tool for identifying pre-disaster mitigation, uh, which is an important distinction from the emergency operations plan, which is also currently undergoing an update, but by a different department, that addresses post-disaster emergency management. Some more about the LHMP. Um, within the local hazard mitigation plan, FEMA requires a risk assessment, which is an identification of all hazards to the community or the largest hazards to the community and analyzing each with respect to the location, the extent, any previous occurrences, the future probability, and impacts and vulnerability, which is the potential consequences to the community, including threats to life, property, and the economy, and what parts of the community are most likely to be affected. The following slide lists all the hazards that we included in the 2023 LHMP risk assessment. Some of these were added after um, engagement with the Climate Action Committee in 2022. I won't go through listing all of these. The non-bolded hazards are either sub-hazards or after effects from certain hazards, but our main identified hazards are earthquakes, public health epidemic, critical infrastructure and utilities failure, Flooding, extreme temperatures, which is under the umbrella of severe weather, damaging winds, also under the umbrella of severe weather, wildland and urban fire, hazardous air quality, slope failure, landslide, terrorism, and hazardous material release. How this is connected to the CAC work plan? The CAC included develop a community disaster resilience plan to address increased hot weather events and air quality events on the approved council work plan. Staff recommends that the committee consider combining the elements to be included in a community climate disaster resilience plan with the elements necessary for the city's local hazard mitigation plan. So we did add extensive information about hot weather events and air quality events in the LHMP. A little bit about the community engagement that we've done and have planned. In February of 2022, 
Uh, the initial kickoff of the plan update came to the Climate Action Committee and we received feedback on suggested updates and hazards to be included. Uh, we did include that feedback in the update you saw with the agenda packet. We did a presentation at the May 17th, 2022 CERT meeting. In February of 2023, the CAC reviewed a draft and provided feedback. That's what we're doing this evening. Um, it is also back in the hands of the CERT group for them to review the draft plan and provide comments. Uh, we're also sharing it with other agencies such as the Alameda County Department of Environmental Health. I send it to East Bay Community Energy um, and some other local fire departments for their review. We'll also be taking this plan to the Planning and Zoning Commission next week, uh, next Wednesday. And then in March or April, we plan to take a draft plan to the City Council. All right, at this time, I'll open it up to questions. And once we do questions and then public comment, we can move on to feedback. So any questions? Um, I had a few comments. Is now the right time to do that? We'll do questions, then public comment, then comments. Yes. But any questions? I guess I'm curious to learn more about the CAC developing the Community Disaster Resilience Plan, but I don't know if now is the right time to talk about that. I can just share a little background. Um, a member of the committee, when we were in the process of developing the CAC work plan, suggested that we include, create a disaster, um, what was the exact thing, the Community Resilience Plan um, to include information about hot weather events and or extreme weather events and air quality. And staff proposed when we last came to the CAC, that we include whatever information would be included in that separate plan in the local hazard mitigation plan since we were already doing it. And there was consensus at that time to include it in the LHMP. Um, of course, it's still on the committee's work plan and um, we provided an update to the city council at the, I think it was in the fall of 2022, sharing that that was included in the LHMP. Um, so that's just some background on that. Other questions? If not, um, we can open it up to public comment. Okay, we have one member of the public with their hand raised. Jeremiah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing this valuable resource. I'm really glad that you're on top of, you know, getting grants um, and things like that from federal, and you're just seeking sources of income that's available. I just want to say thank you. Um, regarding that, it was it was not, uh, nice to learn kind of what we could spend the money on. Um, I'm not sure how much money is available and what our budget is to kind of get ideas. Let's say we have some ideas for the work plan. I mean, what's, what's the budget, right? How much money can we spend on these sort of things? Um, I just graduated in the last CERT class, so I'm sure we'll be discussing that in our monthly meeting. So basically what I want to mention is, is this funding available to use on the idea I had earlier um, regarding the, the upgraded bench? with solar panels and water and electricity, you know, something like that. Cause that kind of is, I'm not, it's, the sun is a hazard for sure. Um, ultraviolet rays and heat. So it is, it is dangerous, but I'm just wondering if that will qualify if we decide to, you know, soup up and upgrade the benches. Are we able to get funding from this to, to install solar panels, shade, canopy. Um, I know we already have funding for the drinking or the water filling stations, um, but maybe some sort of something like that. So yeah, basically I was wondering if, if this sort of funding, can we use it for upgrading benches to, you know, the idea of solar panels and whatnot. Thank you. Okay, our next public speaker is Nick Peterson. Nick Peterson. 
Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm now speaking kind of in my interest as being a member of the Albany um, CERT team. And, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about disaster preparedness, getting our community more organized and um, participatory in this, and did a lot of effort last year on looking at um, pop-up resilience hubs that would be located in the eight primary occupied neighborhood zones, also the zone haven zones of the city of Albany. Um, part of what came out of that was we also, as a group, lobbied heavily during the Parks and Recs and Open State Space Master Plan process to have recognition that parks would include use for uh, disaster preparedness, especially for support of material storage, um, thinking ahead for where uh, these pop-up resilience hub materials could be stored. Um, so um, I was really uh, pleased to see that in the LHMP, there's reference to CERT training being an in integral part of the city process and, and funded by the city and put on by the fire department. But I encourage you to make reference to this um, disaster preparedness aspect of the parks and recs and open space master plan. So there's sort of a final linkage, linkage between the LHMP and that plan. Some sort of reference should be in there that parks and recs has agreed to support that um, need in making the city uh, citizens prepared for in the event of a large scale disaster. Thank you. Okay, we have no other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to the committee for discussion and feedback. Um, I'll just comment that um, EBCE is doing some work on community resilience. Um, there's funding, of the EBCE received federal funds and we have some other program funds um, for putting, if I recall, I hope I'm not misrepresenting this, but um, I think it's putting solar and storage on critical community facilities, including fire stations, city halls, community centers, that sort of thing. So just want to, I, I imagine that staff are in touch with EBCE. If not, then we can discuss, but yeah. Right. We, we did bring an item to council, I want to say it was in October or November of 2022 to pass the resolution to opt us into the program for phase three, what would you say, analysis, assessment. Um, and there's, I think, an action in the LHMP to continue to pursue that partnership and hopefully find opportunities to put solar and storage on critical municipal facilities. Um, so yes, we're very thankful to EBC for that partnership. Excellent, glad you're in touch. Mm -hmm. I had a, well, two comments really on that plan. By the way, I was impressed by the level of detail and the clarity of that plan. There's a, a huge amount of information in there. It's a very impressive document. Um, well, two comments. Uh, one is just a little technical thing. Um, page, let me get it here. Page 67 uh, talks about the, uh, Oh, the regulation for uh, the amount of fine particulate in the ambient air. Mm -hmm. And it says that it's no more than 100 particles per million in the air. Uh, what it actually is, is a weight of fine particles per cubic meter of air. This is the federal, it's the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, the NAAQS for PM 2.5. And specifically right now, it's no more than 12 micrograms of this stuff per cubic meter of air. 
and the EPA is considering tightening that to between 9 and 10. Uh, this is a health-based standard, and they found that apparently that 12 doesn't protect the most vulnerable members of the community. The other one is something that doesn't have anything to do with climate, uh, but years ago I lived across the street from a fellow who was at East Bay Mud. He's retired and moved, but he told me about what he felt would be a real disaster if levee failure uh, compromise the McKellamy aqueducts, all of the East Bay would suffer a huge, huge percentage shortage in water supply, and it would take many months to repair the damage. So this doesn't have anything to do with the CAC, I don't think, but maybe somebody could call East Bay Mud, get some details on that sort of scenario and put it in this plan somewhere. Thank you. If I can go on for just another second, uh, the New Yorker had a really good article about the levy and how everybody is trying to blame everybody else and nobody has the money to fix the problems and so on. I don't know of a way to get that URL to people, but possibly you could figure out a way to do that in case anybody's interested. This is, again, not CAC business, but it's just interesting. Right. Okay, thank you. I think if it's if it's a link sharing information, um, but without any like indication of how you would vote, um, which it wouldn't, because um, to your point, it's not directly related to the CAC. If you sent me just an email that had just that link and said, "Please pass this along to the committee," I could do that. Great. I think uh, the reason I didn't pass along your last email because it had information on how you might vote or feedback. Thank you. These are all things you'll learn about too in the Brown Act training. There's these technicalities. Great. Any other feedback or comments or suggestions? There will be plenty more opportunity for you to provide feedback as um, members of, or individuals, if you'd like to make comments as individuals. And then I also imagine we'll likely bring this back to the committee once more. Am I able to ask more questions at this point, or sure. we'd be on there? Huh? Uh, okay, yeah, I guess tying it back to some, I guess, kind of our presentation earlier around community involvement, I guess kind of what's the plan kind of after this plan is published to kind of make sure that kind of reaches community members? Is it like through individual kind of agencies within Albany that take that up, or is there some kind of like big release of the plan? Just curious. Yes. The plan, I think I wrote a paragraph about this, so before I misquote myself, let me t take a look. Um, sorry, if you'll give me one moment. It is a large document. Here we go. I'm just gonna read what I wrote. Um, the city commits to either implement, advocate for, and or seek funding for each of the hazard mitigation strategies listed in the table above within the next five years. The City of Albany Community Development Department will take lead responsibility for monitoring the plan's progress and tracking the plan's implementation over time. Uh, sorry, this is not answering your question. Um, here we go. It is important that the City of Albany Local Hazard Mitigation Plan remains an active and relevant document and that the city maintains its eligibility for applicable funding sources. The city of Albany's LHMP will be reviewed and updated as circumstances evolved. The community development department will update this plan every five years or sooner if new hazards are identified, if community priorities change, or if other major planning efforts affect the relevance of the information contained within the plan. Um, here we go, this is answering your question. Um, Implementation progress will be provided to the public at public advisory body meetings annually. Community com members will continue to be involved in the plan maintenance process. City staff will make the plan available on the city website, provide annual status updates to a city advisory body with opportunity for public comment, and will engage the public in any plan update process. 
community members will be able to provide feedback at public meetings or by contacting the community development department via phone or email. Community members can also participate in hazard preparedness training through the City of Albany CERT program and join the nonprofit Albany CERT group for continued engagement in community, community level disaster preparedness. I think, Natasha, feel free to chime in. Um, and it was referenced earlier in this meeting, we do have a very active City of Albany CERT group. Um, they're their own organization made up entirely of individuals from the community and they run their own programming. And I think they're a great partner in engaging their community and doing kind of grassroots level organizing around disaster preparedness, um, awareness of what hazards there are and we're looking forward to working with them to not only get comments on this draft plan but also to get comments from them um, throughout plan implementation and engagement with the community just generally about uh, hazard mitigation planning. Because I think what's important to see is that a lot of the actions that are in this action plan are like prepare and adopt ordinances, um, require retrofits, um, follow Alameda County public health guidelines. They're not necessarily actions that the community will implement, but there is so much in here that the community could learn from to engage in their own disaster preparedness. And I think if we're able to work um, with local organizations already doing this work and also partner with our public information officer and use our city channels to educate the public, um, they can be more prepared themselves. And also read this very dense document. <laughs> Natasha, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, that was well said. Um, yeah, I do think the CERT um, group is a great organization um, who has the local knowledge, so I think elevating them in this process is really important. But yeah, I don't have anything to add. Well said, Lizzie. I hope my five minute response answered your question. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or feedback? Okay, well we will, as I mentioned, be taking this plan also to the Planning and Zoning Commission next Wednesday if you wanted to attend that meeting and make public comments as an individual. Um, and you are also welcome to email me with comments that you have on the plan or thoughts or questions um, as individuals. It won't be a, a committee decision if you're just emailing me about it. Um, but you have my email, um, you know how to reach me and I, Look forward to us taking this plan to council soon. Great. Um, back to you, interim chair Fasoon. Okay. Um, is that all for item six dash three, or do we have? I think that's it. Okay. Um, with that, looks like we can move on to item six dash four, which is subcommittee updates, and I see here. We're gonna also view, review subcommittee status and subcommittee memberships for possible reorganization. Yes. Um, I can provide some background here. We currently have a student outreach and engagement subcommittee that consists of our two student members, um, Miroslava and Hadia, and they've been very active. It's inspiring. Um, we have a zero emission transportation subcommittee that currently only consists of Eric Larson. Um, and there's a home electrification mandate subcommittee that was started by Nick Peterson, who you saw earlier. Um, it was a subcommittee of one. Uh, there used to be another member, but it is now, um, since Nick Peterson is not on the committee, it is currently a subcommittee of zero. So I think the action for the committee this evening is to decide for those subcommittees that are currently listed on the agenda, do we want to keep them going? add new membership, rearrange membership, or do we want to sunset subcommittees? Um, I think if anyone wanted to propose a new subcommittee, that's fine as well. Typically the way we do that is if there's an item on the agenda that let's say the committee has a lot of conversation around, lively conversation and a consensus wasn't reached, typically what happens is a subcommittee is formed to do a deep dive into the policy or into the um, even community engagement. Um, so that's typically how we form subcommittees. It's rare that we just form subcommittees out of the blue, I would say. They typically do 
come from or are born out of a um, committee discussion on a particular topic. Um, we've had other subcommittees. Um, Eric Larson could speak to this. There was a Carbon Free Albany subcommittee that did a lot of grassroots community engagement. Um, you'll learn more about subcommittee do's and don'ts um, during the Brown Act training, but if anyone does start a subcommittee, um, I'm happy to brief you on um, how to make sure you're doing subcommittee action without violating the Brown Act. Does anyone else who particularly are members who are returning from the last cycle, do you have anything to add about subcommittees? Um, yeah, I just would um, say that um, the, the Home Electrification Subcommittee had a lot of um, things um, sort of in the hopper. And one of the really interesting one was um, the <clears throat> idea of working with the real estate uh, community on um, point of sale um, mandates for house conversion from one owner to another and the updates that would be possible there. Um, Nick had worked out quite a, a lot of detail about, you know, he did a lot of legwork on, on plans that, um, that could be implemented. And the, the job of subcommittee is to kind of do that legwork and come back to the committee, propose, kind of get up into the point where you have a proposal and then then the cycle, you know, to city council, to um, staff, to, uh, you know, point for staff, and then action would be taken. Um, I know nobody on the committee right now has the background on the home electrification, um, but um, I would encourage, if, you're, if you have any interest, there's a lot of content there already available, that a lot of work that's been done that I would love to see um, continued. I don't have the bandwidth to be on that, and I'm on the. I'm going to stay on the zero emission transportation committee. So, I'm sure anyone, if they were interested in working on the, picking up where the home electrification mandate subcommittee left off, um, you are of course more than welcome to get in touch with the previous member, Nick Peterson, as he's no longer a member of the committee. Um, but at this point, I'll turn it over to the. Well, actually, perhaps we should open it up to uh, public comment um, before we go into committee discussion. Okay. Do we get to ask questions first? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure I understand the process. Oh, yes. Please and, ask questions. And my question is, is there, like, can a subcommittee just be created basically in real time, or does it need to be agendized as a item for discussion in advance? A subcommittee can be created in real time and then we'll add them to the agenda under subcommittee updates as like a running um, subcommittee. So yes, okay. I think as long as it's born out of like, as I mentioned, another agenda item, like let's say, I wouldn't encourage this because of the timeline, um, but let's say the local hazard mitigation plan conversation had been very complex and yeah. members of the committee said, we need to dive deeper into this, let's form a subcommittee. That could come out of that, I would say. Yeah. It would be maybe inappropriate if a random subcommittee were to be born when none of the agenda items um, pertain to the scope of that subcommittee. Got it. That's a good question. Thank you. You'll, you'll probably cover this, but subcommittees are not supposed to be standing long-term um, subcommittees. They're supposed to take on a topic and then you know, kind of work through that. Um, <clears throat> the ones we've got here have longer-term kind of things going, and mm -hmm. so they have been um, a little bit longer-term. But mm -hmm. as, far as, I'm, as far as I know, it's been within the, the guidelines. I think we've been within the scope of the Brown Act. One possibility is if the, let's say the zero emission transportation subcommittee were to choose an area of focus, you could continue to hone in the focus of that subcommittee. Because right now it's a little bit broad. If it were to carry on for another, let's say like six months, we might want to say let's refine the scope, um, which is something we could talk about today too. But yes, per the Brown Act, subcommittees are supposed to be ad hoc as needed, not really standing forever, just kind of there. So would the best time to propose a subcommittee be after the public comment? Or um, or to, to like reorganize them or anything? Or to propose one? To propose one. Um, would that be in discussion? I think that's more discussion, okay. yeah. 
Maybe we'll go to public comment. Are there any other questions first? Uh, I had a question just to understand the home electrification mandate subcommittee a bit more. Uh, can you talk about what the, the mandate piece of that is referring to? Is that like an aspiration or is that some, something that exists? It is, it was designing a program that would become a mandate. So not a mandate that currently exists, one that would be proposed to the city council. I do see the member of the subcommittee previously has his hand raised, so I'm sure he could give you a quick synopsis. Other questions? Okay, maybe we'll go to public comment. We'll start with Nick Peterson. Yeah, thank you for letting me talk about that. Uh, yeah, so I, again, I'm speaking to encourage the Climate Action Committee to continue investigating, um, which I, as we went through this, I saw it more as an incentivizing plan. So um, you know, if we wanna get uh, changes to happen, we're gonna have to require changes. If you suggest changes, or if you um, recommend them, they don't always happen. They happen at a much fewer uh, level. So the idea was to try to come up with a program that wasn't odious, which mandates seem to say. By the way, the um, California um, Realtors Association is wholly against mandates, period. Any kind of mandate, period. So we do have a mandate in Albany for lateral sewer connection upgrades, but that came about because of litigation and uh, you know, cities were forced to do that or be sued or you know, have EDMA come in and do the work and re back charge them or something. So it was a big mess, but finally they do it and everyone ac has accepted it. So nobody tries to not get away with upgrading their sewer lateral before they sell their home. So the idea here would be, how do we roll in for initially homes, how do you convert existing homes to be less polluting and more clean? And the start would be, you start when you sell them, which a lot of money is changing hands, and you make sure that certain disclosures and certain evaluation, very simple evaluation happens on the building's energy efficiency and its electrification um, status. And that gives a score. And depending on the score, there's a certain required percentage of the list price that needs to be somehow spent on the home to improve its performance, either by the seller, by we're not going to tell who does what. That's totally up to the the uh, buyer and seller and the real estate agents to figure that out. So I had come up with a, and there, this has a lot of pivot points and flexibility. So you can make it really low, sort of like Berkeley did when they had their energy efficiency requirements. And I think you know the the basic cost was around seven thousand dollars of the improvements were supposed to happen before that went on to you know be sold so that actually got changed a bit and now it's more toothless and they don't you know they don't really require it you can pass everything on to the sell the buyer which is really what berkeley's um program does now so anyway i really encourage there's a lot of work to do but i think it's a really good program and it'll set the precedent for how we handle existing housing Okay, our next public speaker is Jeremiah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just a public speaker. I'm in no place, shape or form to even suggest what subcommittees you guys should form or, or not form. That's entirely up to you and I respect your decision. Uh, but I had a couple ideas. I don't know if, if you guys can have like a, a short term subcommittee uh, just to work on the work plan, you know, have, have a couple mi members of the committee, um, I don't know, just organize a work plan or, or when it comes up, I, I don't know, bring back to the committee ideas for the work plan. I know the work plan is really important, especially early on. I know a social justice commission, we spent, gosh, six, seven months before we <laughs> figured out our work plan. It just took way too long. So um, I don't know, form a subcommittee for the work plan. Um, and also the last idea was maybe have a representative from this committee 
to maybe attend monthly SERP meetings or have, have a, a subcommittee. It can even be one member, you know, a subcommittee of one member, um, but a, a CERT subcommittee. So that way there's a working relationship and, and great communication between this committee and the Albany CERT uh, club, I guess, um, or group. So yeah, those are my two suggestions is just, you know, subcommittee on the work plan and then uh, a representative or maybe just a subcommittee of one um, to, you know, attend the, the monthly CERT meetings. That way, if CERT on, on Zoom, they have questions, you, you guys are right there and it would just be a great, great working relationship. So those are just my two ideas. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Okay, we have no other members of the public with their hand raised. Back to discussion. Yeah, um, so in the midst of talking about subcommittees, um, this is just like not like an official proposal, but something I would like the committee to start thinking about, um, especially after the presentation, like some kind of subcommittee that specifically works on environmental justice or environmental equity. I feel like our subcommittee should have a specific group that is focused around that, especially given the demographics of Albany and really incorporating like the disproportionate effects of climate on different communities and really focusing on incorporating that. Um, so just something to think about. Um, otherwise, I also really love the student outreach engagement subcommittee mm -hmm. and we have like a specific project going on and a climate literacy in initiative that is being proposed and is getting off the ground. Um, mm -hmm. So otherwise, yeah, that's just kind of something I was thinking about um, in terms of environmental justice. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely within the scope of this committee's um, purview, so if there was interest. I believe to create a new subcommittee, we'd need a motion and we need at least one person interested in joining it. I'll just add, I like that idea. Uh, and um, I, at work, I have access to a fair amount of data that might help inform that subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll just leave that out there. It's not a, an endorsement of the committee of a subcommittee or whatever, but if, if the subcommittee happens, I might uh, offer data if you, if you need it. If there is only a need to have one member, I don't think my term ends till June because it's a fiscal year, right? My term is, my I position as chair ends, but my, I'm still on the committee till June. You're on the committee through your or, graduation okay, so through or June. when you move out of Albany, which I imagine wouldn't be in time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I believe your last meeting would be July. Okay, yeah. um, I mean, if there's only one member, then I'd be glad to use the data that you were talking about and form that on my own. Uh -huh. And I am not making like any strong assumptions, but I also think Claudia would like to be on that committee because we were discussing that together before and we've had conversations before, but if uh -huh. there's only a need for one member, I'm happy to take that on and kind of also do a liaison between the Student Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee and this new Environmental Justice Committee. And right. then I can ask um, Hadia, if she'd be interested in being on right. this new subcommittee. And then she could join next uh, meeting. Yes. We're signing committee member or Chair Muhammad up yes. for a lot this <laughs> meeting <laughs> while she's not here. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, well, yeah, if you would like to make a motion to form that subcommittee, you are welcome to. Yeah, I'm going to make a motion to form an environmental justice slash environmental equity, like something like that, um, subcommittee. Would you like to title it officially? Um, I guess just Environmental Justice Subcommittee should cover it all. And that subcommittee would consist of you for now and then next meeting. Yeah, I don't want to sign her up for anything that right. she didn't formally agree to, but me and then tentatively Hadia, um, mm -hmm. but I'll have conversation with her about that. Do we have a second? 
I'll, I'll second. Great. Um, committee member Fassoon? Yes. Committee member Hodges? Yes. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Vice Chair Melgen? Yes. Great. Okay, I think this is a great idea. Please let us know how we can support. Uh, I'd also like to register my interest in joining the, the zero emission transportation subcommittee. Okay. Um, potentially the home electrification mandate one too, but I, as a new member, I do not know how much this involves yet and right. how, how much it is to join two, sub two subcommittees. So we'll start with the zero emission transportation one. Okay. All right, so our zero emission transportation subcommittee now consists of committee member Larson and committee member Hodges. I'll make sure to connect you both via email. I'm, I'm also potentially interested. Okay. It's three maximum, correct? Three maximum. Okay. okay. Was potentially interested, meaning you want to join? Yeah. Okay. I, I do. <laughs> Hard to commit sometimes, but right, I will right. do that. We need commitment for the action minutes. Um, okay, great. We have the Zero Emission Transportation Subcommittee of Larson Hodges Lieberman. We have our Student Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee of Fasoon Muhammad, our um, newly formed Environmental Justice Subcommittee of Committee Member Fasoon. Do we have any other uh, changes or reorganization desired this evening? Okay, great. And just for those members who are new, um, we typically include the subcommittee updates section of the agenda as a running agenda item um, towards the end of the agenda unless there are um, time sensitive items. But when we do have like a larger proposal from a subcommittee, um, we will make an uh, entire agenda item dedicated just to that subcommittee's discussion item. Um, I also see the time, and at this time, if we want to extend for a few more minutes to cover the future agenda items requests and any public comment, we would need a motion. Um, Lizzie, we, mm -hmm. we also have the subcommittee updates. Oh, and we have subcommittee updates. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'll make a motion to extend the meeting by 15 minutes. So to 9.15? Yep. Um, oh. I, sorry. I have a hard stop at 9.10. Okay. Motion to 9.10. Okay. All right. Uh, do that. Committee member Fassoon? Yes. Committee member Hodges? Yes. Committee member Larson? Yes. Committee member Lieberman? Yes. Vice Chair Melgen? Yes. Okay. Can, can I ask a question? I don't know if we can, just about the subcommittees. Huh? Is it appropriate time? Yeah. Do those need to be Brown Act posted, open to the public? No. As long as okay. it's less than three, and you're not three or decision. three or fewer. Yeah. Okay. Three or fewer. All right. Just checking. Mm -hmm. All right. Back for updates from subcommittees. Um, I can start us off with the Student Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee. Um, so there aren't any huge updates, but from last time we are working on a formal proposal and Hadia and I have met and we are writing that and we've gotten a significant amount of it done um, and it's looking great so far. So I'm excited to have that formally written up. Um, we're gonna run it by some members of the Board of Education um, and then yeah, so it's going good so far. Great. Okay. All right, so zero emission transportation. Um, last meeting, I brought up the topic of um, interacting with the Transportation Commission, and you suggested that 
I meet with the um, Transportation Commission member and just explore areas of overlap and interest. And so I met with Ken McCrosby, McCroskey. He's the chair of the Transportation Commission. And we had a very nice conversation, um, just the two of us. Um, developed uh, idea that there is a, a, we agreed that there's a lot of overlap uh, and a strong interest to work together. <clears throat> um, Transportation Commission has sort of purview of, um, you know, transportation <laughs> in the city. And, um, their active transportation plan update is this year and they're actively starting to work on that. And we agreed that there's, uh, that especially is a, is a great opportunity for input from the Climate Action Committee. And so we talked about um, that there would be, um, uh, it'd be great to be able to discuss in the formative stages of that plan rather than, you know, a plan set and then review. It'd be great because of our strong overlap, it'd be great to have that sort of involved um, activity. And so um, I, <clears throat> we agreed that I would come back and, and um, make this presentation and, um, you know, talk to staff about um, ways that we can work together with the Transportation Commission, probably be better facilitated through staff so we can do anything from a subcommittee work, working group to a complete committee working group to individual, but, um, um, but that's coming up very soon for them. And so it's very timely and um, a great opportunity to have input. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, like my, <clears throat> my leading item was this idea of a shuttle bus between the BART stations and the commercial district. And that was sort of the next thing on the climate action plan that I was interested in pursuing. And, you know, it, it, it kind of the comment was that's very transportation oriented. They've got a lot more resources and experience. And, and uh, so that would be an opportunity for, you know, overlap. And there's lots of, it'd be nice to have not just picking off one little thing, but be involved in the, str the strategy for the work plan. So I would um, ask you to maybe talk to the, the staff person, the transportation, and see how we can collaborate. Mm, can do. Great. Okay. Those are the two subcommittees we have that have members and have been meeting. Any other updates before we move to future agenda items? Okay. We can move on to future agenda items. Um, if there are any members of the committee who would like to announce requests for future agenda items, we do have the running agenda item for a presentation from Vice Chair Melgen on electricity rate setting for April. Uh, I've got a couple items. Okay. Um, one is um, I was looking at the climate action plan overall, and it was um, done in 2019. And so I wanted to see if we could have, um, if there's a, you know, if there's some periodicity to the an update on, you know, work to towards the climate action plan, or eventually a revision of the climate action plan and what that kind of schedule is. So as mm -hmm. a future agenda item, sort of getting some feedback from staff on what the what the plan is for the frequency of updates of the climate action plan. And then sort of the same thing with the, with the work plan. The work plan was um, 21, 21 to 23, so it'll, work plan will be expiring this year. So just an update on what the, um, uh, the work up to the work plan is and what the kind of schedule is. So we're prepared for you know, getting, getting ready for that. Updating the work plan. Yep. Right, just to answer that one quickly, the work plan goes through the end of the fiscal year, a little confusing. Um, so it's through June of 2023, I believe, June or July. Um, and I think after that, I believe there's going to be like another council review of the work plans before we're given instruction on how to go about the work plan update process. It's like a council driven exercise. Okay. But would the updated work plan, the next work plan, would it be, would it be due from us prior to June? 2023, or was, is that when we would start working on the next work plan? I don't know, but yeah. I can get clarification yeah, if if it's known. Huh? It, it's been the the um, strategy for work plan updates has changed as councils have changed, okay. so I can see what is known yeah. and what the plan is, so. and we can definitely do a cap update. We typically do it in the spring, in March or April, so um, we'll talk internally and see when we can schedule one of those. Any others? OK, 
Okay, it's a very quiet group this evening. <laughs> Everyone's maybe getting back into the swing of these in-person meetings. Um, we'll move to public comment at this time. Jeremiah? Yeah, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, yeah, so I was gonna suggest possible presentation from city staff or, or just a possible discussion item, you know, no action. But uh, regarding Albany and whether or not there's a plastic bag ban um, or, you know, what's going on with, you know, straws at restaurants um, and also to go where, because I mean, the grocery stores are, are still giving out plastic bags and there was a ban, but I guess now there's not, it's kind of confusing, you know, and restaurants are still giving out straws, even if you don't ask for it. Um, and, and a lot of this to go where is just a bunch of plastic, you know, and I think one restaurant still using styrofoam cups. So for the new committee members, it would be nice just to have, you know, a presentation from staff or just a discussion on what's going on with, you know, restaurants and grocery stores regarding straws and plastic bags and to go where I think that'd be a great thing to discuss and and um, get that situation organized and what we're gonna do about it. All right, well, thank you everybody. Keep up the good work, have a good night. Nick Peterson. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it would be very helpful, especially since we have several new committee members, if um, there was an uh, update on the city's plans for electrification of city facilities and including the fleet. I know we got, when I was on the committee, there was a 10-year plan that um, for fleet electrification, which seems to really push things way out there. Um, I know a uh, lot of people you know, working on climate change realize now the science has been updated. The next seven years are really the most crucial and if the city is going to truly lead on um, making these changes and demonstrate to the citizens that the city, which is a reflection of all of Albany, is serious and taking on these electrification goals and expecting the citizens to take them on too. I think the city needs to lead in this and it would be good for the city to make the Climate Action Committee aware of what their plans are over the next uh, you know, five-year period, which will be very critical. So again, you know, this is applying some pressure to sort of see where we're at, where we're going, get a clearer picture of it, um, and uh, you know, really strive to be a leader in this because it's not just that we reduce Albany's carbon footprint, which if you know, that was the issue isn't, uh, we can do things that show others how to approach a problem and how to come up with real solutions that have real results that are scalable. And I think that's where our, our largest um, ability is. And I think also the city leading and demonstrating to our citizens that you know we're serious, we're electrifying the city buildings, we're electrifying the city fleet especially the police patrol cars. They're the most visible. Right now they're gas hogs. They roam around the city and they're not a very good representation of what Albany stands for. So it would be nice to uh, see that come back to the committee and the committee to put some pressure uh, or make suggestions that we move a little more quickly on what the city can do to meet goals sooner than 45. Thank you. Okay, we have no other members of the public with their hand raised. Anything else? Okay. Um, Committee Member Fassoon, would you like to adjourn your, your meeting, your last meeting as chair? Yeah, let's go ahead and adjourn. Um, our next meeting is gonna be March 15th, exactly a month from today. Um, and yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone.